Oh. Okay. Um, hook. This is a story uh, from my life, my experience, uh, where ethical concerns, consideration caused me to feel the need to break the law. I broke 11 different federal laws, felonies. If it hadn't gone well, I could still be in jail. So, do you, is that a good hook? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So now I'm going to jump right to my thesis statement. So I would, I would suggest that there's going to be times in your life, there's times in everybody's life, where you see something. A situation presents. Your conscience tells you it's wrong. This is wrong. This is not good. I need to do something. My moral compass, my ethical framework, my NHV class has kicked in here. And now I need to decide what to do. Um, there's only been once in my life when this happened at this level, where, I, where it became compelling enough that I felt justified in breaking the law for what I saw. Uh, as I tell the story, you'll see how I rationalize it, how I justify it. So to understand the story, you have to have a little bit of appreciation for fishing in Alaska and, and those kind of things. So let me start out. So here's a map of what they call the Gulf of Alaska, this, the area circled in red there. Okay, and this story, this story takes place in Prince William Sound. This is Prince William Sound. Okay, right here. So Prince William, this is a close up of Prince William Sound, and Prince William Sound has a few, has a few towns. This is that's Valdez. This is Cordova. Uh, Valdez is the terminus of the Alaska Northwest Pipeline. There is a pipeline that runs the length of Alaska. It comes down from the Arctic. It takes uh, oil that's, that's developed in the Arctic, uh, in the brook, uh, north of the Brooks Range. Then there's a big pipeline that brings it all the way to that spot. At that spot, there is a big terminus. Uh, they have tanks where they store it, and they load super tankers. And those super tankers come out through Prince William Sound, through here, and, and down to California, other places in the globe. The major fishing hub of Prince William Sound is Cordova, which is right here. Cordova is a shallow port. Only fishing boats can go there. The big, the big tankers, the love boat, tourists can't get. Basically, the only place it can go is through here. The Valdez uh, 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 arm of Prince William Sound is deep, so big boats can go in there. So that, that big dark blue line shows the shipping tanker um, route. Prince William Sound is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. It is absolutely, unspeakably gorgeous. Orca whales, sea lions, sea otters, um, scenery like you can hardly imagine. And it's rich with every kind of life. And to, uh, to be there is to almost feel you know, trans transformed to it, especially in summer. Winter, maybe not so much, but in summer, it is really something. This is a little fishing port of Cordova. Cordova is an inter interesting place. In the wintertime, population about 400. In the summertime, during the fishing season, it swells to about 8,000 people. All the fishermen and all of uh, the support things that go with them. It has no roads to it. Only one way to get there, you have to fly in. And you can't get there on big boats. Only little fishing boats can get to it. So it really is completely isolated. There's no tourists that ever go there. It is a pure fishing town. And everything centers around that harbor. And uh, the farthest you can drive away from Cordova is about right here. <laughs> That's it. How do they get cars there? Uh, they come on boat. They, you know, they, bring, they, they have a, a flat bottom a, a, a shallow draft boat that goes over to Valdez and brings cars over there so you can run around in town. But you really don't need a car there. 
If you need a car sometimes to haul your nets and stuff back and forth from the warehouse, but, but you can always borrow one. But most people don't have a car there. Everything just lives around the harbor. This is, and there are five big fish processing plants there. This is one. This is the one I worked out of. Um, in the wintertime, when you leave, you st they, they jerk your boat out of the water and you store it in these, in these uh, processing plants. In the summer, these become factories where they process fish. All right, you, this is your biology lesson, okay? This is what you have to understand. These are the different kinds of Pacific salmon, okay? They all have two names, interesting. Okay, that very, very top one up there, the littlest one, over here it says pink, okay? Pink salmon. Pink salmon has uh, another name, humpies, okay? The next one, this guy here, sockeye salmon. Sockeyes have another name, red salmon. The next one, chum salmon. Chum have another name. They're also called dog salmon. The next one here, cohos. Cohos have another name. They're called silver salmon. And the big boys, chinook salmon, are also called king salmon. Now, we're not going to count this one. This is a Japanese salmon. It doesn't come to our shores, so we won't worry about it. These are the ones that, that run the rivers of Alaska. Now, salmon are interesting. This is what they look like in the ocean. This is what they look like when the fishermen catch them. They're silver. When you, when you buy them in the grocery store, this is what they look like. After they get into the fresh water and they start making their way to, their, to their, uh, where they spawn, all that beautiful red color that's in their meat it starts transferring to their skin. They get a big hook nose on for fighting. Their, their, their body starts to change shape. They get a big hump on their back. And over time, as they're in the fresh water, they become almost inedible. If you catch a salmon that's been in the fresh water a long time that looks like this, or like this, or like this, the meat inside will be all yellow and mushy, yucky. All of, the, all of the protein, all of the texture in the meat has gone into eggs or, or sperm sacs or, or into the color and the body transformation that prepares them to fight and compete for their, for their mating places. Okay, so it's an, it's an incredible transformation. That it, look how different that is from that. And it happens in three weeks. And that salmon right there, that, that silver salmon, looks like this when it's up in its spawning grounds. It's incredible. So fishermen are catching the, they're intercepting the salmon right at the mouths of the river as they're coming out of the ocean before they go into the fresh water. Once they're in the fresh water, they're not, they're not commercially uh, available. And there's a lot of difference in what, what these salmon are worth commercially, okay? So you have to know a little bit about how we catch them. There are two ways that you catch salmon in Alaska. There are commercially. There's the gill netters and there's the saners. Okay, that's important because it's, they use different technology. These are gill netters. I was a gill netter. Gill netters have boats like this and usually a, they're a one-man show. Sometimes you have a friend along but you don't really need them. You can operate them completely by yourself. And they travel around in gangs, packs. I was part of a radio group. I had four friends. I lived with them when I was on the beach. We were just a gang. And when we went out fishing, we went out fishing together. We split up, found the fish, called each other on the radio, zeroed in on them, and scooped them all up before anybody else could get them. That was the game. It's very competitive. You know, a lot of people call it combat fishing. Um, and what you're doing is you have this big hydraulic drum on your boat. And it's 900 feet long, and it's 30 feet deep. It's like a curtain, and it hangs in the water, it has corks, these white things, they're corks that float on the top, and it has a lead line on the bottom, and you can put it in a big curve, or you can put it in an S, or whatever shape you think, you, because you have a sense for where the fish are coming from, but you lay that net out by backing up your boat. You throw the end over, put your boat in reverse, and back up, and it pulls it off the reel, and it lays out a big hook, or whatever shape you're making, and you sit there holding on to it, idling. Fish are pouring into it. You can tell you're catching fish. The corks are bobbing when the fish are hitting. And the fish, they swim into it. 
and their head gets stuck. Their head gets stuck through a diamond. And then you pull that big net back on and the fish are hanging in it like cordwood. And as the fish are coming over the, as the, fish are coming over the bow of the boat, you're standing up there just popping them off and they're falling on the deck. Bang, 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 bang. And the boat is filling up. And then as soon as you get your net clear, you very quickly get back in shape and you put it back out in the water so it's catching fish again. And then you go throw all the fish in your, in your, uh, in your box and do it again. Gill netters are catching the big salmon. The kings, the cohos, basically the salmon that are going to restaurants, the table fish. They're, they're worth a lot of money. Um, the saners, this is me. Those are king salmon. This is my son and my oldest daughter when she was a baby. Yeah, they look a little different, but okay. So there's a second technology that's used to catch salmon. It's called seining. Seining are used to catch the cheap fish, pink salmon. To give you an idea, a king salmon, which can be as big as 80 pounds, they average 40 pounds, like those ones I was holding. Those were $200 fish. Each. Each. Those are worth money. Okay. Even the, even the sockeyes are worth, they're like $20 bills. Okay, they're, now pink salmon, they average about four pounds. Okay, pink salmon are worth eight cents a pound. They're worth, worth about 50 cents. Okay, so the gill netters, you know, who are having to handle fish one by one by one by one, they don't even fish for the pinks. The saners, they take the, they take the water and they're catching them by the gazillions. I mean, and saning is different. You have a big boat and you have a little boat. The little boat's called a jitney and, and they, the net is all piled on the back of the boat and the little boat grabs the end of the net and they pull away from each other and pull the net out like this into a big hook and, and they'll hold it for a while, catching the fish that are coming into it and then after they after they think they've got enough or when they're getting moved out of position by the tide or something, then the little boat brings the end around to the big boat and they make a circle like this. And then the little boat passes the net off to the big boat and takes a line and hooks it onto the big boat and goes out here because once the circle closes, the big boat is dead in the water. It can't move. All it can do is pull in the net. And so it could drift into a bad spot or on a rock or whatever. So the little boat hooks onto it and goes out and, and kind of pulls the whole operation and it keeps it safe. And what the big boat does is it slowly closes the bottom of the sack, closes the bottom of the sack and turns it into a big purse. And then it lifts that purse over and it catches fish by the thousands. Well, they're, they're, they're going around and around and around. And if you, if you synchronize the timing of, your, of what you're doing, you, 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 have to do, you have to try to close it and get around. The, the fish stay together in big schools. So you get, once you get the loop closed, then you close the bottom of the purse, and then it starts to collapse. And then they start breaking out, but they can't go anywhere. So it's important to understand the two kinds of fishing this story takes place, I had been in Alaska gill netting. I was kind of done with my season. I was getting ready to go home and I had a friend who was a purse saner. And he said, will you stay for a couple of weeks and run my jitney for me? Uh, so I said, oh, what the heck. I had never done it before, but you know, I was experienced. And, I, and so I said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. And so I stayed with my friend and did that job. Usually a purse saner boat has four people. Somebody to run the jitney, the captain, and two people to work the net. Uh, so that's background, background, okay? So what happened in 1989? Um, there was a huge full tanker, uh, the Exxon Valdez, it was named, and it was coming out, the arm of Valdez, and right here, just as it was opening, the big part of Prince William Sound, it slammed into Bly Reef. Turns out that the captain was an alcoholic and was on a drunken bender and 
wasn't paying attention in the stormy sea and, you know, yada, yada. It's just gross negligence and the largest oil spill in world history took place. This happened in 89. And now you can see where Prince William Sound is, right here. And because of the way the winds and the tides work in the wintertime, that oil spill oiled all of this part of Alaska. So going back to our big map, just so you can see, that would be all of this. Now, people who had fishing permits where I did, in Cordova, we were fishing in what's called Area E. Area E covered from here to here. Okay. So we did have a part of our fishery that was south of where the oil went that was still untouched. And actually, that's where the gill netters made a lot of their money. It was the saners that did most of the fishing in Prince William Sound. So everybody on the planet was following it. It was that international news. It would probably have been before your, uh, the days when you were paying attention, but it was a big deal. And it was traumatic. And there were pictures every day. And uh, some interesting things happened. Exxon was very much on the defensive. And um, immediately, the first thing they did was they went to Cordova, where all the fishermen were, who, who were very worried, very upset. And they hired about half of the fleet in Cordova, put them on the Exxon payroll. The fishermen said, well, what are we supposed to do? Uh, you're on standby. We'll call you. Basically, they were paying them to be quiet and not make a fuss. So half the fleet just kind of sat around and waited to see what was happening. Uh, by summertime, um, the, as, this, as, as the sound was waking up and so forth, um, there were all kinds of investigations that began. Congress was very uh, early. Uh, into it, and I was working for Congress at the time, which is was how I became acquainted. I was on the staff of, of the House Interior Committee that was investigating what happened, um, how bad it was, uh, what was the cause, how serious was the impact, and so forth. And we weren't getting any straight information. It was a big snow job. It was all designed to try to mitigate or minimize public uh, outcry, public anger and, uh, over the issue. So we went up to Alaska, and it was really interesting. We got to Cordova and went into the school uh, gymnasium, and there were, uh, there were all, these fi all these fishermen who, it turns out, were on Exxon's payroll, who were all sitting in there quietly listening. And then there were all these fishermen in the back against the, the back of the gymnasium like this. And we later learned out those were the ones who hadn't taken the money and were just ripped, angry. And uh, they turned out to be really interesting to talk to. And they were really concerned that we not buy into the snow job that was being orchestrated to try to mitigate, to pacify, and to deflect from the seriousness of the harm and so forth. And those fishermen in the back were more than anxious to load us up in their boats and take us out in the sound and show us what people didn't want us to see. And it was interesting. Um, there was a lot of pressure on Exxon to do things. And they organized these massive, very people intensive, and they would go hire everybody who they thought would otherwise be complaining. They would go to the Indian villages in Prince William Sound and hire them all. They'd go to Cordova and hire everybody. Uh, everywhere they could find people who would otherwise be complaining, well, you got hired to go on the next uh, cleanup crew, and they would go to beaches uh, with television cameras and, have, and, and, and stage these big operations where they were hosing and 
people rubbing rocks with toilet paper and paper towels. It was just, it was just a lot of busyness, a lot of, of activity. Uh, they'd film it for half a day and then they'd load everybody up and they'd take them all back to Cordova. They didn't really clean up anything. Actually, they made a bigger mess than there was before because they left all their uh, lunch bags and garbage and, and, and crap on the beach and clean up anything. And so this charade went on for quite a long period of time. And it was well known. I mean, the people, the local people all saw it for what it was. But it was making great TV. And Exxon was doing this to try to show you know, that they cared, that they were being responsible, yada, yada, yada. It is, it is in, in some fairness, at this particular time, the oil spill cleanup technology was nowhere near what it is today. It was in its infancy. They really didn't know what to do or how to do or how to have any, uh, uh, the amount of oil that they may have cleaned up. Um, uh, that actually, there was an interesting thing that went on. The, the angry fishermen were so frustrated by how little was being done that they went and they organized themselves in their own boats. And they went out with five-gallon cans. And they would lean over the edge of the boat and scoop oil with five-gallon cans off the top and dump it in their fish hole. And then they would go back, and the Coast Guard was offloading it for them. And the fishermen with five-gallon cans had cleaned up more oil than all of Exxon's professional cleanup operations. And, they, and, and at the point where uh, it was becoming really obvious and it was getting attention, Exxon succeeded in getting a cease and desist order to the fishermen because it was making them look bad. So this was the state of, of, of affairs in the immediate aftermath. And the fishermen were all aware of this. More pictures of the cleanup, quote unquote. As soon as the cameras were gone, it all shut down. In the meantime, um, the damage kept occurring. Now, you've all now learned a new term, right? For a, a species that is critically, out, has outsized importance in an ecosystem. What's the name of it? Keystone. keystone species. Are salmon a keystone species? In this, in this ecosystem, they are. And there's something that you need to understand about salmon. I mean, think about this for a minute. How in the heck do salmon come down from a tiny stream somewhere way up in the mountains, into the ocean, swim as far away as Japan, and find their way all the way back to the very same stream, very same river, all the way up that. And they've never been there except once when they were this big. But they can find their way back. How do they do that? That's one of the miracles of nature. Anyone know what the most important sense they have? It's olfactory. They, can, they, they imprint on the scent to a, such a degree, uh, the scent of their birth, that they can refine that place, having, have, you know, having no other cues to go on. And they can go back into the huge ocean and, and disappear for years. Now, there's something also important to know about the salmon. The difference between a pink salmon that averages four pounds and a king salmon that averages 40 pounds is how long they spend at sea. A pink salmon goes out two years and comes back. A sockeye salmon, a red salmon, goes out four years, come back. Cohos go out four years, come back. King salmon go out six years. And then they come back and that's why they get so big. Okay, so think about this now. Spill happened in 89 and we're now at 1993. So now we're, we're starting to see the first returns of the majority of the fish. Only the pinks have, have been on a short cycle. So we're at the first four-year anniversary where, the, where all of the salmon who are in the four-year cycle or larger are starting to show up and come back. Now, what do you think happened to the smell of the water when all that oil got dumped in it? Okay. So then, so there was, the, there was the way it smelled immediately after the fill. And then, the, then nature started its suds, sudsing and washing with waves and tides. And so it was dissipating it over time. And then the oil companies did another thing. Uh, one of the 
one of the mitigation measures that was just gaining kind of experimental popularity was uh, Inipold. Anybody know what Inipold is? Inipold is a chemical that you can fly over, spray it out of an airplane, it falls on the oil and it makes it heavy and it sinks it so that it's not floating. Okay. The, the important thing is it's out of sight. Okay, so when you put Inipold in the water, what does that do to the smell? Changes it again. When you sink it, put it on the bottom, what does that do? Changing it again. It's out of sight, out of mind, but it's still there. So all these changes are happening. What is this doing to the, to the keystone species? They're, it's really, really messing things up. You know, in the ecology of Prince William Sound, which in turn is messing, messing things up for everything that's dependent on the salmon. So, <clears throat> fast forward, now we are in, so what have I just done? I'm, I'm still in background, right? Okay, I'm, catch, I'm telling you this story. I, it, my, my background's a little longer because I lived this. So I have more information and I have more time. So in, in 19, 1993 now, and I'm running the Jitney on, on Robert Michael's same boat, and we are fishing it, we are fishing in an area called Port Nelly One. Salmon, when they, when they come in uh, out of the deep ocean, they, they kind of follow tidal currents and they, they pass in a, in this, you can pretty much predict exactly where they're going to be at a given point in time. So they, they go out here and they gather up in big schools and then they come in and they come in through here and they come around that corner right there heading for, 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 for uh, spawning grounds all over in here. Fishermen know they're coming. They know they're going to come around that point. And so the big saners get in long lines, maybe 20 boats long. And you go out to the point, open up, hold it for 15 minutes. They call it 15 minutes of show, access to the open ocean. Then you close up and drift off, and the next boat comes in behind you and opens up, holds it 15 minutes, closes up, drifts off, and just, the fishermen do it like it's like a dance that they've done a, you know, forever, and it's just kind of very systematic. This is what, where we were and what we were doing. We were doing the traditional dance, taking, taking uh, um, uh, turns off the, the point at Point Dan. But it was different this year because we would take these big shows, usually you'd produce somewhere between five and 10,000 pounds of fish. You go over and close up, three fish, five fish. These big sand boats are expensive. And it, they got crews of four, they're burning fuel. Uh, you, you're, if you're not making 5,000 pounds, 6,000 pounds a haul, you're going backwards. You're losing money. And after a couple of days of this, this group of saners, this group of fishermen were starting to get a little hot under the collar. Something's wrong. Uh, this is not right. We're pretty, un we're pretty unhappy about this. And the reports were coming in, the, the, so the, 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 the salmon fishermen, the saners got together, about 250 of them in the fleet. They hired a spotting boat, a spotting plane to go out here and fly around, see if they could see fish jumping out there in the ocean. You know, that maybe they're just a little late. Spotting came, uh, planes came back and said, yeah, there's tons of fish out there. Big, huge schools, and they're just going round and round and round. Because they can't find where they can. They're, go they're confused. They don't know where they're going. Their bodies are getting ripe, and they're going to die in big cabals out at sea. So this is the situation. And so... Uh, in Port Neliwan, on that island, there's, a little, there's an Indian village of Iyak Indians. This is it, Chiniga. And, and uh, at the end of each fishing day, I would sneak over into Chiniga and get my New York Times. Uh, the one, one thing I had to have when I was fishing is I had to keep track of politics because I was only going to be away for a couple of months during recess and then I was back in Washington working. So this is what I did during my break is I fished. And, I get the uh, New York Times from Chinig and I'm taking it back to the boat. We're sitting there reading it as we're sitting in line. And I started, I said, I look, I can't believe it. Um, after the spill, 
the U.S. government, of, well, first of all, let me back up. In connection with this bill, everybody brought lawsuits against the oil companies. You know, the Indian villages, the fishermen, they all sued for damages. Everybody in Alaska did, almost. And that went into the court processes and it went on and on for 10, almost 20 years before it ultimately got resolved. So that was going on, but everybody knew that that was uh, a civil uh, process that was going to take a long time. The U.S. government, using it, our environmental laws, you remember uh, I talked about RICRA and CERCLA? One was present, one was past, present damage versus past damage. Under RICRA, the present damage, uh, the government fined Exxon immediately. Find them one billion dollars. Okay, it was natural resource damage fine. The one billion dollars was placed into a trust fund. The trust fund was supposed to be immediately available to fund cleanup and uh, repair environmental repair projects. Okay. Now, what happened under the law? Uh, uh, the president at that time uh, appointed trustees. Uh, to manage the fund, how it was spent. It just so happened the president at the time was fairly close to the oil industry, and the trustees that were appointed were all former retired executives of oil companies. So when they took charge of the billion dollars and how the money would be spent, how much integrity do you think they had to real science that was going to document the extent of the damage? I don't have to explain it. Your intuition is correct. So this story that I read in the newspaper, the first big tranche of money out of the billion dollars that was supposed to be spent to repair the environment had been, a check had been written, almost $200,000. What was it? It was reimbursements to Exxon for all that television cleanup activity that they had spent money on. Propaganda. Exactly. So imagine how you would feel. You're a fisherman sitting on the line at Nelly One, burning fuel, burning money, crew of four, expecting to make your, your, your year's livelihood, and your, your every single pass is a, another water haul. And now you learn, now you become aware of the first big tranche of, of, of money from the, from the trust settlement, from the trust fund, has been doled out to Exxon. So we look at this. We're sitting there, and uh, of course, the, the news doesn't sit in my lap very long. Uh, I happen to have my computer with me, and I had a printer with me. This is back in the first mini versions. But so uh, so I, I I talked to my skipper, James Michelin, and I said, "We got to do something. This is this is outrageous." We got to do something, and we talk back and forth, and we're brainstorming, and uh, so we come up with some ideas, and we said, "All right, first thing we got to do is we got to get everybody on board. We got to we've, we've got to talk about this." So we did a little press release that summarized the story of what was happening to this money, and my son, my six-year-old, is with us, and we pumped up a dinghy, a little rubber dinghy raft, and put a motor on a kicker on the back of it. And we printed out about 40, 50 copies of this one-page press release that tells what happened. And I handed them to my son, put him in the dinghy, and he went up and down the line, handing them to every skipper. Now, you say, well, why did he do that? Why didn't you just get on the radio? Why didn't we get on the radio? Who do you think, who do you think monitors the radio? Of all, the, all the fleets in Alaska. It's, this, it's, it's constant background noise in every Coast Guard station in Alaska. The, the fishermen, the fishermen are talking about what's happening out there. The Coast Guard's always listening. So you couldn't talk about it on the radio. So we had a flyer, and the flyer said at the end, okay, everybody, tonight, tonight at, cl at closure, when the fishing grounds would close, they close the, they have opening, close, open, close, because they have to make sure enough salmon are getting by, if there are any. So tonight at closure, everybody chug into Chiniga, anchor up in the harbor, let's have a talk. 
So 6 o'clock, everybody shuts down. These big boats are all chugging in there, and that harbor fills completely up. The boats are all tied to each other. It's like a big, like a big city. And everybody goes into the uh, basketball gym. That's the basketball gym right there. So here's 250 fishermen and their crews sitting in this basketball gym. Now they've, they've all heard about it now. They're all in a, what do you think the atmosphere of that room is? People are hot. And you gotta, you gotta think about, Alaska fishermen are all independent businessmen. They're like the last American cowboys. And they're very competitive with each other, combat fishing, to get the fish. Um, so these, these are pretty rough and tumble people. There's some women uh, who have their own boats. Um, a lot of them are Native Americans, and they're as tough as, as the men. <laughs> so this group is sitting there and talking, and you know, now, now this was a little bit of a political concern because the Saners are not my family. My family are the Gilnetters. The Saners don't know me. I was doing this for my friend. I have no, I have no leadership with them. Um, so, and I, I knew that. So part of the early part of this was to spend some time on the boats of three or four other people who I knew uh, everybody would look up to and respect, who could be uh, kind of organizers and leaders. And one of those was a fellow named Jim Gray. Everybody called him Big Jim Gray. He was a former tight end for the San Diego Chargers, a mountain of a man. And um, he was perfect, and he was pissed. And, um, and by the time we get to Chiniga, we, we have a pretty good idea in our mind of, of what, what we could do, what we should talk about. I want to back up just a little bit, because it's really important that you see something. So there we go. All right, follow my. So here's Valdez. That's where the terminal is. That's where they offload the oil from the pipe. And then the big tankers have to go out through here. And then they have to go through that narrow neck right there. That's called the, Va the Valdez Narrows. The Valdez Narrows is three quarters of a mile across. It's not very, not very wide. Only one tanker can go through at a time. They have to take turns coming and going. So we sat there. And one of the things that we had learned when Congress was doing investigative hearings after the spill, we learned a lot about the operations of the terminal of Valdez. We learned that the storage facilities only can handle about three days worth of storage. And then they have to offload it. If they don't, if they can't, they have to shut the flow of oil down in the pipeline. We learned that they've never done that before. It's never happened since they built it. The reason it's never happened is because the oil coming out of Prudhoe Bay in Alaska is very thick and viscous. They worry that if they ever stop the flow, it could congeal, and they might never get it going again. It would basically be a clogged pipeline. So there is a necessity, there's an urgency about, uh, about those operations, and that they are constant and running smooth. So we sit there in the room, and we talk about this, gentlemen. What do you want to do? They have a weakness. If we are together, all 250 of us, we can shut down the Valdez Narrows. Shut the flow of oil from Alaska. If we can hold it, pressure will mount. The price of oil will go up all across the United States within a day. If two or three of us try this, we will be arrested in a heartbeat by the Coast Guard. If all of us do it, they can't handle it. They can't arrest all of us. If they try to run us, we can start laying our nets, one in front of the other. Boom, boom, catch the biggest fish of our lives. If they try to run through it, our nets together will tangle up in the prop and run it aground, and they know it. Epic David versus Goliath. Epic standoff. You want to do it or not? 
We are going to be breaking the law every which way from Sunday. At this time, we don't know how many specific laws, but we know we will be breaking the law. And we know that people will be ticked. So we talk a little bit more. And, and so at that point, we say, well, what do we hope to accomplish? Why are we doing this? And so we have this conversation. And now I want you to this. I'm giving a little hint here. We say, you know, if this is about us, we will fail. This cannot be about us. We have to be acting on behalf of the American people. We have to be acting on behalf of the country. We have to be willing warriors who are taking, who are righting a wrong and bringing attention to a crime. Not for ourselves, not because we want anything out of this, but because we want a fix some kind of justice of some kind. And so we, we thought about it and we said, so well, what are our demands? And we came up with five things. Number one, Exxon has to return that money. That money is not theirs. That money belongs to the American people to be spent for the environment. It should go back to the fund. Number two, fire these trustees that are oil goons. Hire real scientists who can assess what the opportunities and the needs are and write a mitigation plan that, has a, that, that is designed to work. And then in our thinking, we said, truth be known, there probably isn't a billion dollars worth of good science and mitigation to do. Truth be known, nature is probably going to have to do most of this cleanup itself over time. So do what you can do, what's justified, and then take the remainder of the money and stop the bloody clear-cutting in Prince William Sound. At this time, they were clear-cutting huge swaths of forest all through Prince William Sound, rafting up the timber and, and taking it to, to Japan for sale. So how is nature ever going to restore itself, ever clean itself up, if you're clear-cutting all the estuaries where nature is doing its cleaning work? So we said, if you can't come up with real science, take the money and buy conservation easement and stop the clear-cutting so that nature has a chance. And lastly, none of us go to jail. Those were our five demands. And we had a vote. And, uh, everybody in concurrence with, with the demands. Why, why we're doing it, what we want, what we hope to achieve. Unanimous. We said, all right, final vote, important vote. Who's in, who's out? Everybody who is willing to drop everything, what we're, everything we're doing, the fishing season if necessary, take the risk, and go and throw up this blockade. Raise your hand. Oh, God, I love fishermen. It's unanimous. And go. So, so then we started planning. He said, OK, we got to go back out tomorrow, fish, just act like business as usual. Nobody can say a word on the radio, nothing about this. Tomorrow night at about 9 o'clock, um, in Alaska in the summertime, the sun goes in a circle. It doesn't really go down. And there is a period of, of dusk where it kind of gets really low in the sky and goes kind of along the skyline for four, five, six hours, and then it pops up and goes around in a circle again. So we said we have to disguise our move. If all of us are crossing through the center of Prince William Sound at one, like a big long, like big long train, somebody's going to say, "Where are they going? What's up? This is not normal." You know, if we had gone, <clears throat> we'd gone right across here and up there. So we said, "What we will do is, when the dusk comes at nine o'clock, we'll just all quietly just slip out and sneak along the back here 
and slip along behind these islands and slip along through here, just hiding, hiding until we get to the Valdez Arms so they don't see us under cover of, of twilight. And then when we're in position, we will be able to organize and slap up the blockade. Well, wouldn't you know it, um, as it turned out, the next evening, the summer's worst storm. <laughs> Absolute, horrific storm. And uh, the sky went black, it was raining sideways, blowing 40, 50 knots. And we're trying to trudge through these islands, through these kind of treacherous waters where there's lots of shallow spots. Can't see two feet in front of your face. So we, we got in the line and we didn't want to talk, but everybody would turn their crab lights. The crab lights are called the big lights that are up on your mask. And so you'd get behind the boat in front of you, had this crab light, and we just got in this train. And you know, and you're going up and down and you know, and waves going over the top of the boat and and uh, damage, you know, the wind and waves are blowing windows out, and people lost jitneys, people had mass break, people lost nets. We, we incurred a lot of damage as we were trudging to our destiny. Oh, I should add one thing. Uh, the last thing we did after our meeting, everybody authorized uh, me to stay in Chidiga and get on the phone. It had one telephone and call all the press I know. And I knew a lot of press because that was my job. So I, I spent the night calling. CNN, NBC, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, LA Times, and said, tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., we are going to blockade the Valdez Narrows and shut the flow of oil from Alaska. You want to be here. Get on a plane right now. It's going to be big. And uh, it's going to end. So we got the word out, and then we took off into this epic journey across the sound. So y'all, who, who know, have you, has anyone here heard uh, of, of what they talk about as foxhole buddies? What happens in wartime? What, what's the phenomenon? Why, what makes it possible for people to charge into certain death or do, do things that, that normally a, a rational sane person would never consider doing because of the risk? What, what's the phenomenon they talk about on the battlefield that that enables those kind of things to happen. It's the, it's the bond, it's the courage that develops between, between uh, platoons, you know. You know. Why did you do it? Why did you jump up and run into a firestorm of lead? Well, because my best friend jumped up and was going and I had to go with him. You know, this is, it's a phenomenon that happens in trying times, you know. For human beings, we, when we go through great uh, trauma together, it, it binds us. So this journey, this epic journey through the night, through the storm, suffering, taking all these hits, imagine the effect that that's having to these fishermen. They are, bond to, they are bound together so tight after going through this that by the time they roll out at, in the morning, the next morning into the Valdez Arm, they are, they are battered and they are bruised but they are a cohesive unit. And uh, so they, we all filed up to, to, the, to the Valdez uh, Narrows, to the perfect position there. And we haven't been there five minutes when we can see coming, coming up the uh, Valdez Arm, the first big tanker. Now we had all agreed that we would let full tankers out. We don't want to cause another spill. Full tankers can go, new ones, empty ones, no. And so the first big tanker is coming up the Valdez Arm. We haven't been there, I don't know, 15 minutes. This is it, this is a picture right here, taken, taken off the deck of, of the tanker, and this is us, sitting there in the, uh, in the Valdez Arm. <laughs> you, can, you can see down here, this picture here shows you the narrow neck right there. That's the narrows. That's all we have to block. And so we're sitting there and this, this standoff begins. 
<laughs> and here comes, and, and, and get this, talk about Hollywood. The very ship that they're choosing to try to bust through is the repaired Exxon Valdez that's been renamed the Vatican Pass, but we all know what it is. So, and by, and about this time, there are all these boats that are racing out from Valdez with cameras, all the newspapers, all the TV cameras, all the major networks, and they're all offloading onto our boats. And the, in the meantime, the Vatican Pass has radioed the Coast Guard. We have these hooligans, and they are threatening to blockade, and we are proceeding. And as they get closer, the fishermen say, all right, we gotta, we gotta make this real. They gotta believe. And so the fishermen just start, start coming around and we start laying our gear, laying these big nets, big seine nets, one right after the another. And, and just, it looks like we've practiced it for months. Looks like it's, it's, it's as smooth as a marching band. And as soon as you drift out, you pick up and you go get to the back of the line, you lay your, and, and so what we're doing is we're creating a visual image that we can, we will stop you and we, we can do it. You cannot push through us. And then the Coast Guard helicopters are coming in, you know, and the Coast Guard, the first one, and they're flying down low over, and it's, it's really, really bumpy. It's been stormy. The water still, you know, still got about four foot, foot uh, waves on it. Uh, so we're bouncing around, and, but there's no way they're going to board our boats. It's too rough, and they know that. So the Coast Guard comes down and starts going on the radio, calling our, calling our names, calling our boats. You are cease and desist. You're violating the law. You're all going to be arrested, yada, yada, yada. And, and everybody's listening. We're all sitting in there thinking. And then, <clears throat> and then one of my um, um, buddies, I won't mention his name, and I won't say exactly what he said because it has too many expletives. <laughs> but basically he said, kiss mine. <laughs> Just try to board my boat. And then, and then more voices start coming from each of the boats. And pretty soon it's like a chorus of, of colorful, <laughs> colorful challenges sailor's to the <laughs> sailor's language to the Coast Guard. Uh, say, basically, make my day. And there's a point at which the Coast Guard realizes that we're not backing down, and this is going to be a catastrophe. And there is a point in the Valdez Arm where if they don't stop, and turn around. They can't. And so uh, as they were reaching the fail-safe point, Coast Guard said, all right, back up. Turn it around. Go anchor up outside. And so just, we won. Standoff was over. The boat went back out into the deep harbor, anchored up. And then over the course of the day, about every two hours, another one would show up. Pretty soon there were 20 tankers out there. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> And now, and now, within 24 hours, stories are running, and we are on international, international news all over the world. Price of oil, uh, price of gasoline has already gone up a dollar in California, everywhere. Um, so here's Valdez, and here's the block. So what we did after we did the blockade, and, the, and the, the big tankers had to come out anchor up, then we all just kind of pulled over into what they call Jack Bay. This was a nice place where we could get out of the neck, but we could reform ourselves in 10 minutes if we had to. But we could rest up and wait. And then, uh, then the message comes to us from the Coast Guard. Uh, do you have any leadership? Uh, the governor of Alaska wants to talk to you. The five presidents of the oil companies that are partners in, out in the pipeline all want to talk to you. They're all on jets. They'll all be in Valdez tomorrow morning. Um, and the Secretary of Interior is coming from Washington. Um, uh, do you have someone we can talk to? And so, so there was four of us um, and my six-year-old. <laughs> and so we went into Valdez to talk to them. And I looked just like I did in that picture. Beard, rain gear, you know, boots. Uh, we, were, we looked like fishermen. Had big Jim Gray as our... Leader, leader, 
And we get into Valdez, our first meeting that they've lined up for us is with the presidents of the five Alaska partners, Exxon, BP, Shell, and we're in, we walk into the lobby of the Holiday Inn, they're all sitting there with their lawyers, there's either 50 of them. And um, they start yelling and screaming and, and it's the guy, the, the CEO of Exxon says, you, you will never ever get out from under, you know. And they're just threatening us and just really being ugly. And we sat there, just like this. <laughs> and and um, after about half hour of it, uh, Big Jim Gray stepped forward and he, we had practiced this. And he looked at his watch and he said, gentlemen, you have about 16 hours of storage left and we can hold. And then we just turned and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from that, and then we walked out of there and then we had the mayor of Valdez said, oh, oh guys, um, Guess what? The the uh, governor Wally Hickel of Alaska wants to. We didn't want to meet him. He was we just, he was useless. We knew he was a captive. Of the, so we said we don't want to meet Wally Hickel. We'll talk to him later. He said, uh, well, the uh, Secretary of Interior, uh, Bill Clinton, the new the new president, uh, has sent uh, Bruce Babbitt, Secretary of Interior, to meet with you. You want to meet with him? Yes, absolutely. Um, he said, well, he'll be at the fire department in about 30 minutes. So we walk through the streets of Valdez up to the fire department. Big entourage comes. There's all these press people. We're being really careful not to say too much. We're just kind of holding, holding our own counsel. And big, big uh, entourage pulls up, out steps Bruce Babbitt, big tall. He's about 6'4". Um, walks over, um, shakes his hand, uh, and he says, all right, uh, I'd like to speak with these gentlemen alone. No press. Press is now screaming, oh, we have a right to be, you know, all this. Is that all right with you guys? Sure. All right. No, no worries. And so we go into the police, we go into the kitchen. And uh, they have bar stools in there, I remember. And he kind of pulls one up and sits on it. And we all pull up a bar stool and he gets this big smile on his face. And he said, gentlemen, the president woke me up in the middle of the night, told me to be on, on an Air Force jet out of Andrews. He said, price of oil, uh, price of gasoline in California has gone up a dollar. Everybody in the world is watching you. You are at the top of the mountain. Do you have an exit strategy? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a way down? And that's when we said, yes, we have. We've thought about it. And we gave him our five commands. And I'll never forget this. He looked. And a big smile crept up over his face, and he goes, damn, he said, that's brilliant. <laughs> he goes, he goes th those are things we should be doing anyway. He said, he said if, if I walk out of here, and I thank you for what you've done on behalf of the American people, and I announce those five things, and agree to them on behalf of the U.S. government. Can you stand down? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what he did. He walked out, gathered everybody around. He thanked us um, and committed the U.S. government to do all five. Um, and then he turned and he said, uh, are you going to be seeing the oil company execs again? We said, yeah, they want to see us next, after you. We have a second meeting with them. He said, can I see them first, <laughs> privately? We said, sure. <laughs> Our first meeting didn't go so hot. <laughs> so he went down and talked to them. And then we came in afterwards. We, get, we got notice that he was done. We didn't see him again. And we went in and sat down. It was like they had all seen Jesus. <laughs> it was amazing. Change of heart. <laughs> so long story short, um, to finish up, there's the 11 crimes. We got a nice letter from the Coast Guard explaining to us the felonies that we were. Oh, these are that over here. 
And here's our, here's our five, here's our five requests. All five of those things, as I said, were done. Uh, the first thing they did was they fired all the trustees, the old oil uh, goons, and hired new scientists. Uh, they went to work and rewrote a, a, a mitigation plan, and they actually created the Prince William Sound Science Center in Cordova to manage and implement the plan. And um, as we had suspected, they couldn't come up with a billion dollars worth of justifiable mitigation cleanup activities. So they took the rest of the money and went to work and started buying conservation easements so that the timber uh, in Prince William Sound could be, the habitat could be preserved and nature could do its own work. And this was published in 2004 as a, as a report on uh, all the things that were done um, in terms of both uh, the, site, the mitigation and the conservation easement and the restoration work through the Prince William Sound uh, Science Center. And this is a map that shows all the places where they purchased land, conservation easements. And the final, fifth demand, uh, we were exonerated. And, and that's the story. So mine was pretty fun. Pretty flashy, pretty dramatic. My guess is um, you know, most of the moments of truth where your conscience will speak to you and require you to step up and do something, many of them will be very, very uh, uncelebrated, very quiet. You may be the only one that really knows. All right, done. <laughs>